let's begin with just the review of a couple of things we talked about in the last class. So just discuss with your partner what is the IRP, interest rate parity, and TPP, purchasing power parity. We didn't get back their case analysis, take back their case analysis yet. Kim Arrow. That was just explaining the idea of arbitrage, right? So in arbitrage, you can't get a loan. That would be arbitrage. You can't get a loan at cheaper interest rate than you deposit, right? But how is arbitrage related to the IRP? Don't know, okay. Uh, Yu Gyeong Sun, Yi Qing Wan, Qing Wan. What is IRP? You don't know what IRP is? Uh, Kim Ye Ran. What is IRP? Uh, future exchange rate is affected by interest rates. So the future exchange rate is related to the interest rates. Why? Look at the first sentence on this slide. Rate. Forward rate is based on the interest rates, right? Do you understand forward rate? Forward rate means the future exchange rate. 
It's based on the difference in exchange rates, or interest rates. But why? What's, why is it the case? So look at the first sentence on the slide. Do you understand the first sentence on the slide? So can you tell me why we have it? Can you say that in, in your own words? Can anybody explain that in another way? So if the IRP failed to hold means if we if we didn't have IRP, right? Easier way to say we didn't have IRP, then people would be able to make an easy profit. Okay? Arbitrage is making an easy profit from a basic inequality. Okay? So if we didn't, if the forward rate was not based on the difference in interest rates, people would be able to make an easy profit. So we looked at the examples in the last class, how they can make an easy profit. Okay? If we have a different forward rate. So we're not going to go through that again. We already went through that. So then the second question, what is PPP? So Trey J. Where is Trey Jay? Yes. What is PPP? So I need to work time. Hmm? What does it stand for, first of all? What does PPP stand for? Purchasing power parity. Purchasing power parity. Okay. What does that mean, purchasing power parity? Yongshin? Yes. What does purchasing power parity mean? It means price is all equal, uh, all the Asian equal price. Mm -hmm. So the exchange rate, mm -hmm. the exchange rate should what? Exchange rate means. So just put exchange rate into the sentence. You need to put exchange rate into the sentence somewhere, right? So if you were a sentence would be, the exchange rate should be uh, the, based on the prices being equal in the other countries, okay? That would be purchasing power parity. So if McDonald's hamburger is five krona in Norway and two dollars in the US, then what should the exchange rate be? One dollar is 2.5. Okay, so the, the exchange rate is based on the fact that the price should be the same between the two countries. Okay, is that true in real life? No. No, it's not true. Okay, so really we're concerned about the change in the purchasing power parity. What's another word for the change in purchasing power? Another word for change in purchasing power? Begins with I. Inflation. Inflation. Do you understand the change in purchasing power is equal to inflation? If there is high more inflation, do you have more purchasing power or less purchasing power? Yes. Okay, so we're talking about inflation here. So here forward rate is based on the difference in inflation, right? But it is, they're basically 
The same thing. Why? Because we have the Fisher effect. What does the Fisher effect say? What does the Fisher effect say? Fisher effect links these two things. How? What does the Fisher effect say? What's the relationship between inflation and interest rate? Inflation goes up and interest rate also goes up. That's a long way to say. How can you say in a short way? Use the word follows. The interest rate follows inflation. Does everybody understand that? If inflation in the US is high, what are they going to do? Increase the interest rate. If we have no inflation in Japan, are they going to increase the interest rate? No. Right? So, we saw in the last slide that the two equations equal each other, right? This one is based on the difference in inflation. This one is based on the difference in interest rates. Okay, but interest rate is following inflation, so it's the same thing, really. Okay? So we can just use interest rates to make the forward rate. Okay? For the future exchange rate. Okay? So we said the last time that there are many things that can affect the exchange rate. Can you remember what affects the exchange rate in the short term? What affects the exchange rate in the short term? Hmm? What? People following trends, that's important. If you are going to work later in investing in stock, the stock market and banks, you need to know what affects in the short term, right? Are you going to invest in the short term to make a profit? Or it's too risky? It's too risky, unless you have some insider information and that's illegal, right? So it's very risky to invest in the short term, under six months. Okay? Why? We can't predict what's going to happen because of speculators and investors following trends, okay? If you want to invest for less than six months, then you can follow the trend. Do you like following trends? No. Is it easy to follow trends? No. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, right? So it's risky. That's what some people do. What about in the medium term? What affects the exchange rate in the medium term? One year to five years. Hmm? One year to three years, kind of two years or three years. What affects the exchange rate? Fiscal policy. Trade, current account. Monetary policy. They use this one, right? Interest rate. What affects the exchange rate in the long term? Inflation, right? Inflation is the biggest predictor over the long term. Inflation is quite accurate. If you have high inflation, your currency gets weaker over the long term. Is inflation a good predictor in the short term? No, it's not. It's long term, right? Productivity also, long term. Okay? So we said it's not easy to forecast the exchange rate. It's easier to do that in the medium term than in the short term. Okay? <clears throat> so then let's move on to the next part. Do you have any question about the forecasting exchange rates? No? What is the most reliable way to forecast the exchange rate used by the banks? IRP, right? The, using the difference in interest rates. That's the most reliable one that's used by the banks. Okay? So let's move on to talk about the optimal currency area. So we're going to introduce about optimal currency areas, look at some criteria. We're going to ask, is Europe an optimal currency area? Okay. So usually currency area borders coincide with national borders. So the same country uses the same currency. That's what that means. Okay. The United States uh, in the 19th century, they, were a lot, they weren't the United States. It was a lot of Fed, just different countries. Right? And then they decided to make the same country. Okay? They all joined together. India, China. China has a lot of different areas or regions, right? But you're in the same country. 
also in Russia. They're a very big country, but you're in the same country. So you use the same currency. Okay? But it doesn't, this doesn't have to be the case. Some countries can use the same currency, even though they're different countries. Okay? So the question is, how can we decide? Delineate means draw a line. Which countries should use the same currency? Which country it's a good idea to use the same currency? Which countries it's not a good idea to use the same currency? Right? What economic criteria should be used? So we're going to look at the benefits of making a currency area and the costs of joining the currency area. The euro is the biggest currency area, but there is also some currency areas in, in Africa. Okay? Perhaps <coughs> other areas in the world like South America and Asia are looking at Europe with interest because maybe if the euro is a success they can also make a currency area use the same currency or fix their currency together okay so discuss with your partner this one first what do you think are the benefits of having the same currency and what is the cost of having the same currency so discuss with your partner just imagine that you're going to make a currency union with Japan you, you and Japan are going to use the same currency, right? Or maybe even China, Korea. Okay? What would the benefit be and what would the cost be? Okay, so let's start writing down here. What's the benefit? Can anybody tell me a benefit? Trade. Right, similar to what we talked about when we talked about fixed exchange rate versus flexible one, right? What else is a benefit? You can cover the exchange rate. The exchange rate risk. No exchange rate risk, so that's why trade is better, right? No FX risk. Okay. One of the reasons trade is better. Another reason trade is better. It is easy to control and monitor the policy. Everybody has the same monetary policy. Is that a benefit or a disadvantage? Disadvantage, monetary policy. Okay, we all have to have the same. Everybody has to have the same monetary policy. This is especially relevant when we have a crisis. We want to change the monetary policy, we can't. Okay, any other benefits? Easy to go out of the country. Yes, there is lower transaction costs. Do you understand transaction cost? Yeah. I need to change my money. I have to pay the bank the difference between the buying and selling price. That's a transaction cost. I have to go to the bank to change my money. That takes time. That's a transaction cost. Okay, anything else? Uh, less risk in the world, speculative attacks. Hmm? Uh, protected from speculative attacks. You mean speculators? You said that it's mm. good for Ireland to be in Europe. Yes. If we make the full currency union, then it's. Uh, if we don't just fix our currency, if we use the same paper money, can protect against speculator attacks, right? So. In the case of the UK, they could be attacked because the UK can easily leave the ERM, right? They have their own pound, they don't need to change anything. But nowadays with Greece, it can't easily leave the euro, okay? It's not easy. They have to print all their own money. That's going to take months to print their own money. They have to, they, 
When they join the euro, they have to destroy their printing presses. That was one of the conditions. Do you understand the printing press? Yes. Can you make a printing press in one day? No, it takes months. And then you have to print all the money, and then you have to change all the ATMs. Right? So it's a long process. So it's not the case that Greece could be attacked like that, okay, in the same currency. So any other disadvantage or advantage? Yes? Advantage that it's, the currency is more stable, so it attracts in investments. So no FX risk, stable, right? This can attract investment. So when Ireland and Greece and uh, <laughs> Portugal and Italy joined the euro, people got really excited. They started giving a lot of loans to Ireland and Greece and Portugal, right? Mm -hmm. Then they did different things with the money. In Ireland they built houses. Irish people like houses. So they got a bit excited. In Ireland the interest rate was always very high, around 7 or 8%. Mm. They joined the euro. The interest rate was going to be much lower. They have the same interest rate as Germany. Okay? And people are going to invest there because there's no risk the currency will depreciate, right? So a lot of people invested in Ireland. So they gave loans to the Irish people. So who do you think is the fault? The Irish people who took the loan or the people who gave them the loan? Let's say I, there was an example of an Irish guy in the middle of the countryside wants to build a supermarket for 20 million. Right? Do you understand? Build a supermarket in the middle of the countryside. It costs 20 million for the land. Right? So he asked for a loan. Foreigners want to invest in Ireland. Here's a loan. Who's, the, who's at the fault? The foreigners who gave him the money or the guy who took the loan to build a big supermarket? Later the supermarket is a failure, of course. It's in the middle of nowhere, right? Who's his default? Hmm? Both of them, right? They should share the fault, okay? Not just the guy. So, uh, this is a big debate in Europe, right? Especially from Germans. German has an old population. So the older people in Germany, they got the low return in Germany. So they want to get a higher return in Ireland or Greece or Portugal. And they think now there's not much risk because there's no foreign exchange risk. It's stable. So now we can invest in Ireland, invest in Portugal, invest in Greece, right? So they start to invest a lot of money there. They caused some bubble situation and crisis ended up, okay? But then they don't want the creditor who lent the money, they want to get all their money back. Do you think they should get all their money back? No. No, so that's one of the debates in Europe, right? So we can have this advantage, but another disadvantage is that if we do this suddenly, we can get a bubble. People invest too much in our country, right? It's better for the country, but we have to be careful about bubbles. People getting overexcited. Okay. So then, any more cost or benefit? Credibility. Yes, credibility. So we have more credibility. We are more friends. We have more friends in the international. Right, we are cooperating with other countries. We can get more business. Right, a lot of German businesses, banks came to Ireland and set up in Ireland. It's goodwill. Do you understand goodwill? Credibility. Anything else? Yes. Maybe that it's not easy to leave. Disadvantage. Can't leave easily. Right. Anything else? Okay, so well done. We wrote down a lot of them, right? So here we have eliminate the current currency exchange costs. So sometimes the bank charge about 10%. That's a lot if you're a business, regularly doing business between Korea and Japan. You always have to pay 10%. And then even worse if you're doing business between Korea and China and you're changing to US dollars. Right? You change the one to the US dollar, you have to pay 5% to the bank. You change the US dollar to the Korean to the Chinese currency, another 5% to the bank. Okay? So you're losing money on that kind of transaction cost. So
So if you have the same currency, you don't have to change your money. Okay? Uh, less risk, uh, no exchange rate risk, more price transparency increases the competition. Do you understand price transparency? Before I go on holidays to Italy and I see the price in lira, I've no idea how much that is really. I just pay the lira. I don't think about it, right? But now I go on holidays to Italy and I see, oh, those shoes are just 20 euros. In Ireland it costs 50 euros for the same shoes, okay? So now I, I know that shoes cost a lot less in Italy than Ireland. So what am I going to do? I do. What business am I going to start? The. The. Buying shoes from Ireland and selling in Italy? Yes. No. Uh, no. Yes? <laughs> shoes buy the Italy and Ireland and selling them. Buy the 50 euro shoes in Ireland, sell for 20 euros in Italy? <laughs> No, no. So I buy the shoes in Italy, right? Sell in Ireland. So it increase the competition. There's more competition. It's clear about the prices. More <coughs> price stability. Not as high inflation, right? We don't see, tend to have as high inflation. In Ireland, there's lower inflation. In Italy and Greece, okay? Uh, the more people that's in the union, the more benefit we get from these things, okay? Cost of monetary union, the big one is we lose our monetary policy, right? Or we can't make a cheaper exchange rate to set our goods more cheaper. And this matters especially when we have asymmetric shock. We're going to talk about later asymmetric shock. And price and wage stickiness. Do people like to reduce their salary? No. Which is easier, to get people to reduce their salary or to reduce the value of your currency? Right? Both are ways to make your products cheaper. If you reduce the value of your currency, people's wage is still the same, so their, their rent, they can still pay their rent and so on. Just when they go abroad to another country, their money is worth less, their salary is worth less. Right? But people don't like, it's hard to get a situation where people's salaries go down, rents go down, right? prices go down in an economy. They're sticky. Do you understand sticky? Sticky means doesn't go down, can't move, doesn't move well. Okay, so uh, symmetric shock means we have a shock, the same shock in every country. So it depends on what kind of industry are you in. So if we have two countries, country A and country B, and they have the same industry, they are 40% manufacturing. Right? And they are 20% financial industry, let's say. Then there's a crisis in the financial industry. That's a symmetric shock. Right? Financial industry crisis, they both have a symmetric shock. It's the same. Okay? Let's say this is A or A and B, right? Then let's say this country is 40% finance, right? And just 10% manufacturing like Ireland or the UK, okay? And this country is 50% manufacturing, okay? More manufacturing like Germany and lower finance, okay? So what's going to happen if there's a shock in finance? Is that a symmetric shock or asymmetric shock? Symmetric means you look in the mirror, everything is the same, right? Asymmetric, it's not the same. Asymmetric shock, okay? Which economy is going to have a problem? A. Economy A is going to have a problem. Big problem. Is economy B going to have a problem? No. Not really, just a little problem. Do they want to have the same exchange rate and same monetary policy or different exchange rate and different monetary <coughs> policy? Different. Right, so asymmetric shocks can be uh, a problem, okay? So, with the symmetric shock, uh, the, the, the world demand curve gets lower. So everybody has to, we can all make, in this case it's a symmetric shock, right? Let's say in manufacturing. Shock in manufacturing here. Then what can we do? We can both depreciate our currency. We can depreciate the euro, right? That will help us 
to sell more. Do you understand? We can both. We are both happy with depreciating our currency. Okay, there's a reduction in demand for our goods, so we, we want to depreciate our currency, for example. Or we all make our wages lower. Okay? So just, we have the same exchange rate, and we, we just, both of us reduce the exchange rate. Then asymmetric shock. Just A is hit by a shock. Okay? A is hit by a financial crisis. But not B. Okay, so the central bank depreciates, in this case, A is okay. Okay, so A, here we have depreciate. Okay, A is happy. Okay, they're happy, smile face. Okay, are they happy with the depreciated currency? No. What, what could happen here in B? They have too much demand for their products, right? So they can have inflation. So B is going to be sad. Inflation. Do Germans like inflation? No. No, they don't. Inflation is why Hitler came to power. So Germans really don't like inflation. Okay? They don't want to have inflation. So if the central bank does nothing, right? Here we just do nothing. What's going to who's going to be happy then? He's happy. Everything is okay, right? Is A happy? No. No, they're not. They're unhappy. Okay? So this is what happened in the Euro. They did nothing. Okay? Then, this, well, they did something, but not what this country A wants, right? More what country B wants. So country A was not happy. Okay? High unemployment, a lot of people losing their jobs, that kind of problem. So, <laughs> we could try and make some in the middle, okay? So we try to get in between these two extremes, okay? But uh, in the long run, we can get back to equilibrium. But the problem is, A will experience a recession. Reduction in output and employment. So in Ireland, for example, unemployment went up to 15%. Okay, in Greece and Spain, they have also a similar thing. Falling wages and prices. Okay, and B, B gets excel inflation. So are we happy if we're in the middle? Just in the middle, between do nothing, and they're not happy. They have inflation, and they're not happy. Right? So is that a good situation? For the countries? No, right? They're, neither country is happy. Uh, but they're not as unhappy as they would be in the extreme. So that, that's more like what Europe did, right? So, uh, for example, the property prices in Germany was increasing. The house price in Germany was increasing, right? Because uh, investors wanted to invest in Germany. But other countries had the problem. So, asymmetric shock, just country A is affected, the demand goes down, country B demand is the same. So just this country gets the unemployment from the lower demand, okay? This country is okay. So, we have some uh, theory about the optimal currency area, it was made by Mundell, and he says, uh, just he has six criteria which he thinks we need to have a currency area. Three of them are economic criteria. We're going to talk about each one. Labor mobility. Can the workers move between countries? Product diversification. Do we have a diversified economy? Openness. Is our economy open to trade? And three political criteria. Fiscal transfer. Tax being paid across different countries, homogeneous preferences, people like the same thing, and solidarity versus nationalism. Are people very nationalistic? Do they think just our country is the best one? We don't care about other countries, right? So if we have these criteria, if we think about each of these criteria, uh, we can 
ask the question, which reduces the problem of asymmetric shocks, right? For example, labor mobility. If we have an asymmetric shock, can the unemployed people move from country A to country B easily, right? Can people from Greece move to Germany easily? Do they speak the same language? No. Do they have the same skills? They have financial degrees, they want manufacturing people? No. Right? So that kind of thing. That's what we're going to talk about. So let's start with labor mobility. So what is labor mobility like in China? China is a very big country. Do you understand labor mobility? What does labor mean? What are we talking about when we talk about labor? Workers. What does mobility mean? Move to another. Move around, right? Is there high labor mobility in China? Yes. Where do people do people go far away to work? From western parts, far rural parts to city and eastern parts. Okay. Is that easy to do or hard to do? Not very hard. Not very hard. And if I want to move from western China to Shanghai, can my kids go to school in uh, Shanghai? No. no. Uh, he can work uh, work there, but can't study there. Maybe. Okay, so there's some regulation, right, in China between the states, so not full labor mobility still there. Okay, but generally you speak the same language, right? Yes. Can the people in Western China be understood well in Shanghai? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Everybody, what about Beijing? It's okay. How many different dialects do you have in China? Uh, mainly it's, uh, eight kinds. Eight kinds. In Beijing, they speak Mandarin Chinese, right? In Hong Kong, they speak Cantonese. Uh, but most of the uh, most of them you can easily understand. You can understand each other anyway, yes. and work there. Yes. Okay. So, what about the United States? Do you think the United States has good or bad labor mobility? Good. good. What about in Russia? It's also a big country. Yes. Do, would you think about moving to Vladivostok? Um, no, usually people migrate to Moscow. <laughs> go to a big city, to Moscow. What about Siberia? <laughs> Very cold. So a little bit like China, people are moving towards the big city. It's the trend. But they can do that. There's no problem, right? If there is some crisis in one part of Russia, let's say there is some part of Russia which just depends on the oil or mining or, or wood, can the people move and get a job in another area of Russia? Yes. They can get. Can they get new skills, training, and that kind of thing? Okay. So then, those countries are okay, right? So, remember the asymmetric demand shock we talked about here. Okay. If labor moves from A to B, so there's a problem here. All the work unemployment is high here in Greece or Spain, right, we all move to Germany, okay, or unemployment is, is high in Western China, we all move to Shanghai, okay, then that's fine, not such a big problem, okay, but there are some problems, barriers to movements, legal, like maybe if you're from Western China you can't send your kids to school in Shanghai, right, that could be a barrier, okay, cultural barriers, we have different culture, okay, I'm from Greece, I move to Germany, I start crying because I'm a very emotional person and I'm very friendly, but Germans are not friendly, they're rude. They don't like me. I feel sad, I want to go back to my mommy in Greece. <laughs> right? Why don't they why don't they say nice things to me? Why do they always have serious faces? Right? Why why don't they ask me out? Right? So the Latin culture and the Germanic culture is quite different. Okay? So maybe they won't be happy to live in the Germanic culture. Okay? Obviously language barrier. Okay? Japan and Korea. Could you go and get a job in Japan? No problem? No, uh, it's a problem. It's a problem? Why? Uh, I can't speak German. So. You can't speak German, so you can't get a job in Japan? <laughs> <laughs> you mean Japanese? Okay, so... Uh, we have differences in product mixes. We talked about here, in Germany they have manufacturing industry. Maybe in Greece 
they have to be skilled, right? Uh, one of the <coughs> big car companies in Germany, Audi, they said they want to hire some of the migrants from Syria. You know the refugee crisis? Yes. So they're like doing some corporate social responsibility, right? They're going to train them how to work in the car factory and teach them German and hire them in, the, in their factory, okay? So the workers need to be retrained how to work there, okay? But the labor productivity can be reduced until they get the training. So it's a, it's a little bit like there's some debate about also when the foreigners, migrants who don't speak the language go to the school, right? Then in the elementary school they lower the standard of the other students because the teacher has to go more slowly and that kind of thing. So a little similar argument for the workers. The workers is not as productive as the home country workers, so the labor productivity would decrease. Even if we train these people and take them right, they could st the labor productivity will be lower. So they are kind of problems. <coughs> so, the, do you understand the first one, labor mobility? Do you think Europe has good labor mobility? I think the main issue is going to be language, right, between countries. Uh, more people can seem they can move to the UK rather than the other countries because they, they learn English, right? So the next one is product diversification. What does diversification mean? This Dividing your investments. Dividing your investments in different areas. Right? So it's the same for companies. Which is better? I just make uh, cameras, right? Or I make cameras and t-shirts and cars. What do you think is better for a company? Second one, why? Yes. Okay, if there's a problem in the camera market, people make some different way of making a camera, and we are very slow to react, then at least we have the other business, right? So it's the same for countries. If we are a country just dependent too much on one product, then we could have more problems. But if our country is making a lot of different products, then we could be okay, right? Do you think this country looks okay? 40% finance? No, right? That's a problem currently. We saw Iceland. When Iceland had the financial crisis, their president said, we have to go back to fishing again. <laughs> right? Iceland used to get most of its money from fishing. Then it got all the money from the financial area, but too dependent on the financial area. Financial area crashed, they didn't have anything else, just fishing. Go back to fishing, right? Do you understand? Yes. So we should try to make a diversified economy. So countries who have production and exports which are diversified, they're better to go into the OCA. Okay? If we're a country who's just dependent on one product, then we might, it might not be a good idea to go into the same currency area. Because this area is hit by the crisis, <coughs> then we have no, we're going to be in big trouble. We can't control our monetary policy and we have a recession. And we don't have any other industry. Okay? So, uh, also similar structure. If we have the same, same structure, it's better for the OCA. If we have different structures, very different structure, not so good to do it together. Okay, so, <clears throat> we can focus on what determines the frequency and severity of asymmetric shocks. So if countries are similar, we don't have many asymmetric shocks. Okay? And many shocks tend to be sector specific. For example, decline in world market prices for a certain good. So recently, the oil price went down, right? Maybe, do you think Russia is very dependent on oil? Mm -hmm. So then if Russia is very dependent on the oil prices, it might not be a good idea to make a currency union with another country, right? Because if you have the kind of recession, you can't react with the monetary policy, okay? So, if a country is well diversified, this kind of shock will have 
not big consequences. <clears throat> so do, do you understand product diversification? Yes. Do you think Korea is a well diversified economy? Uh, no. We the major in car, car and electronic machine. So how could Korea get an asymmetric shock? What do you think shock in the world industry would be a big shock for Korea? Korea get an asymmetric shock? I think it's very dependent on the car industry and the electronics industry. So what if people stop using smartphones? They find something else, Google Glass or something, right? Who knows what people will invent, right? What if people have only, to, you can only have electric cars, government make a new rule, you can only have electric cars. Right? That kind of shock. Do you think Korea would be affected a lot? Hmm? Or not? Diversified. What do you think? Hmm? Do you know the main industries in Korea? Cars? Shipbuilding? Semiconductors? IT. IT? Okay. What about China? Is China a well diversified economy? You have Lenovo, computer industry? Yes. Yeah, so China is trying to diversify now because it was too dependent on exports, right? Of low cost good. So nowadays they're trying to diversify, right? If there was some shock on the, that kind of area, on the exports, then it could be tough. So now they're trying to move up the value chain also, to higher value products. So Ireland, we said Ireland was too dependent on finance. So after the crisis, a little bit like Iceland, Ireland reduced, they, they put two banks together, right? Join the bank. So reduce the size of the banking and financial industry. Okay? A little bit. Uh, so then, <coughs> do you have, oh, let's just mention openness, last one, I think we have time. So, countries, do you know that two of the most globalized countries in the world, open for trade, is Korea and Ireland, right? Means that they trade a lot with other countries. So they're very open countries. If we're open to trade, and we trade a lot with each other, then it's better to form the currency area. Okay? So Korea is able to make, for example, FTA with other countries because they trade a lot with the other countries. They're quite open. Okay? So again, we're talking about asymmetric shock. Okay? If two countries are well integrated and trade mostly with each other, then exchange rates don't matter much because this integration means we have strong competition between the companies. So the competition means that the price will adjust as soon as the exchange rate changes. So uh, <coughs> German companies can easily come and set up in Ireland, right? Companies from country B can come and set up in country A. Companies from country A can easily go and set up in country B, okay? That, and they trade a lot with each other. Then we can have the same currency, okay? But we don't trade much with each other. My company can't go to your country, right? My company can't go to your country, then it could be a problem, right? One example is Germany, their banks, it's hard for German banks to come to Ireland or Irish banks to go to Germany because the language and the local contact, contacts and the regulations are different, okay? So we have to think about how open are we? How open is our economy? So, then let's finish there for today.